Captain Paul Fisher and the Chief of Police, Ken Cop. They're here from the Rutgers University Police Department and they're going to speak to you all today about their services. And then after that, we're going to be joined by Mark Sharp and Barbara Blackwell from the, from the campus of off-campus communities, no, off-campus living and community partnerships. They're a brand new office, so we're trying to get it to where their department is going to roll off of our tongue. So they're going to present to you all today. After they're done with their presentation, we're going to have a Q&A. So at that point, these departments will join us and we'll be able to ask away all the questions that you have because we know you guys left, we have a lot. So without further ado. Um, how many of you have been at my previous presentation? Okay. Uh, how many of you have sons or daughters that live off campus? Okay, so the majority on campus. Okay. Um, a little bit about me. Um, been here 20 years. Uh, was a student here at Rutgers. Uh, graduated in 95. Lived on Livingston campus. Um, was hired uh, directly out of college. This is the only place I've worked um, full time, uh, in a full time capacity. Uh, made my way up through uh, uh, the police department. Was appointed chief in uh, 2012 and have been chief since. Um, I was uh, recently given the title of executive director of public safety. I have several areas um, that, I, that I oversee. Uh, police Department, OEM, which is our Office of Emergency Management, which is the office that we're in right now. Um, emergency Services, uh, which is our ES and fire uh, response unit. And uh, Security and Technologies, which has our, does our security cameras, access control, and some ID card. Um, Paul Fisher, uh, similar, um, took a similar route. So what I took, he's been working here for approximately 15 years and made his way up through uh, the police department as well. Um, he is in charge of all patrol and investigations. <coughs> so everything patrol related or investigations related, he handles. Um, this is just a snapshot of where we used to be and how far along we've come. So this was our old headquarters at 5 Huntington Street. <coughs> This building was built in, uh, was finished in about approximately 2007. So we were operating out of a little haunted house, and now we're in a state-of-the-art facility. And I know some of you, the last time you were here, took a tour of the building, um, but we invite you to just peek your head in at some point in the Fusion Center. You'll see our camera set up and our 911 communication center. In terms of the RUPD, we're a fully functioning police department. All right, we operate 24 hours a day, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The community that we serve, I have system-wide responsibility. Okay, so that means I have responsibility for New Brunswick, Newark, and Camden. Okay, I have chiefs in Newark and Camden as well. But that system-wide tie is very important because um, we see information that needs to be fed through the system. Sometimes something happens in Newark that may have an impact in New Brunswick or Camden or vice versa. And it's good that we, we utilize the same records management system. We utilize the same 911 communication center. We have all the information flowing as one. Um, in terms of size, when you think about Rutgers, think about us in terms of a, of a municipality. Okay, there's 500 municipalities in New Jersey. We would be the eighth largest municipality in the state of New Jersey if they kind of bunched us up and put us, put us out in terms of municipalities. It's just an org chart kind of showing um, how I report. So I have a dotted line for the chancellors on the, uh, uh, with, with the various uh, colleges in the system. Um, I have a dotted line to them. I have a, a, a solid line to Bruce Fain. He's a senior vice president, and he reports directly to the president of the university. Okay, this is just an overview of the police department. Um, our, our numbers fluctuate, but we're a little bit over 130 officers system-wide. It's one RUPD, okay? We have several locations, but we're all one department. 
All right. Uh, currently in New Brunswick, uh, we have 59 officers. We have 13 currently in the police academy. Okay. There's turnover that goes on, and to be honest with you, I've kind of grown to accept it. All right. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to get some new blood into the system. Um, we have a lot of young, eager officers that are out there doing their job, and we kind of build them in-house, okay? A lot of them, we take them as students uh, at, that work in a, a community service officer capacity. They work for us. They become full-time security officers. They work in a full-time capacity for us, maybe postgraduate, and then we take them and they become police officers. It's good because they know the system, they live here, they kind of they kind of know the way that the, the place is set up, so it's worked to our benefit. Um, as I said before, we're a full service police department. Um, those two civilian areas that I spoke about, the students, they work as community service officers and our, our uh, full time uh, civilian unit uh, in the security division, they're, they're full time. They have duties such as writing parking tickets, um, you know, eyes and ears for us. A uh, patrol function, a service function where they're out, out there jump starting cars, they do security escorts, and they help us staff large scale events. This is one of the areas that's under my control as well uh, emergency services. We have a 24-7 uh, ambulance response, okay? That's here on the New Brunswick campus. So if, you know, there's a, a 911 call for a medical emergency, we're not beholden to other municipalities to come and respond. We have our own ambulance. So they're getting there, they're getting there fast, and they know where to go. Um, the emergency services unit also has a lot of our uh, fire inspection bureaus, um, sprinklers, uh, fire alarm, and just general fire inspection. They do that throughout the whole campus. Um, they also have a training bureau that does defensive driving, first aid, and CPR. Office of Emergency Management, the office that we're in right now, they're the planners. Okay, they um, they plan for major events. Um, when we set up for a football game, they're doing a lot of the intelligence work, setting up the assignments for officers, and when we have something like a weather event, they're punching out information to the community and kind of getting us prepared, whether we're going to have classes or not. You know, kind of making those determinations. In this room, the room you're sitting in now, it's called the EOC. Should we have a major event that occurs on the university where we have to bring everybody together, we have to bring all the stakeholders together, the people who make the decisions, this is the room that they'll be in. These are our action plans. What these are are plans that we have for the community for what people need to do, okay? Um, so this is for the students, this is for faculty, this is for staff, okay? And what these are are general plans, okay? When you think about the thousand buildings we have throughout campus, when you think about all the different operations we have going on, we don't have individualized plans for each building, okay, in terms of how you respond, how, how they would react to an emergency. So we have general information on this web page that'll give them information about how to respond to a suspicious person and everything from how do you respond to a suspicious person to how do you react to a weather event it's all right here and we ask that people read this prior to an emergency okay this is not where they're going to be going when an emergency is going down because we want them to kind of have the intelligence prior to as I mentioned before, our dispatch, our dispatch center, it's a full service 911 communication center. You dial 911 from a landline within the university, it's coming right here, okay? Um, we handle well over 3,000 911 calls annually. Um, calls for service are in the tens of thousands um, every year. Um, if you look in that room, we also have communication with university buses, all right? Um, all our all our police are equipped with radios, so are the cars, our security personnel, our CSO personnel, which are the students, but our buses have them as well, okay? So think about that. All those buses riding around, they're eyes and ears for us. So technology, uh, in terms of camera coverage uh, on campus, 
close to 3,000 cameras and we're growing. Um, cameras are recorded 24-7, uh, okay? We, we have monitoring capability, but we couldn't possibly monitor, monitor 3,000 camera, 3, cameras at all times, okay? So we have them recording and they, they hold on to, the, the DVRs hold on to data for a certain period of time. The majority of our Rutgers building and residence halls, they're equipped with access control. Okay, so when the students go into uh, residence halls, they have to slash in, okay? So when you put those two technologies together, when you think about cameras and you think about access control, it's an important investigative tool, okay? If we do have something that goes down, we have a place to start. As long as we have a time and location, okay, we can pull access control records and we can pull camera coverage and, and we can kind of get a start on, on you know, where we need to start an investigation. Um, our police vehicles are equipped with uh, mobile recorders, okay? When an officer makes a car stop, um, that officer is being recorded um, by audio and video, okay? Um, and that information is up, uploaded digitally to a database in-house. Uh, we have some vehicles that are equipped with ALPRs. Those are automatic license plate readers. So when they're driving around, they're just collecting data. Okay? So if we have an incident that goes down and our ALPR car was in that area, we'll pull data from that car as well. Uh, blue light phones, okay, that's a, a hot topic, have about 80 of them on campus. Right? <coughs> Not a lot of people use them, and why is that? Because they have their cell phones, right? So it's a technology that we still have, but it's a technology that we're not dependent on, all right? Um, we still have them, but we see more calls come in from cell phones and landlines than we do the blue light phones. Community policing, all right, it's a model that we follow. It's partnerships with the community to identify problems and solve problems. Uh, we designate officers specifically to work with the community to identify problems and, and resolve them. We run about 200 programs a year through our community policing unit and we present uh, custom programs. So if we have a, an area that's facing a certain problem, say one building is facing a, a, a theft issue, you know, we'll do educational programming with the students, with the RAs, to kind of address the problem. Um, in our, one of, you know, a problem that we face on a regular basis is theft. Okay? And most of it is because items were left unattended. All right? We have students that come here, and this is their first time living away from home. They may be inside their dorm. They leave their laptop in one of the common areas because they want to go back to their room for 20 minutes, maybe talk on the phone and do something. Okay? Sometimes laptops disappear. You know? And with that goes their work for the semester. All right? So I'd like you to remind your student, your, uh, your uh, son or daughter, uh, one, don't leave items unattended, and two, lock your dorm door, your dorm room door, okay? Um, most of the crimes that happen here are crimes of opportunity, okay? And what we want to do is, are, is limit those opportunities. Just a snapshot of what we do in terms of statistics. Um, in New Brunswick, we respond to approximately 16,000 calls for service. Arrests, about 500 annually. Um, and I'm going to get into it in a second. We also patrol the adjacent Rutgers community. Okay, in terms of our detective bureau, do uh, you want to sure. quick snapshot of that? Sure. So uh, we have a fully staffed detective bureau um, with very hardworking uh, men and women in there. I'm particularly proud of them, obviously, because I came from the bureau prior to being promoted to captain. Uh, it conducts the follow-up criminal and suspicious incident investigations that have occurred on campus. Uh, they investigate approximately 800 cases a year. On top of that, they do so much preventive work um, and special details, I couldn't even tell you. They're really, really dedicated people. Their responsibilities include uh, identifying, interviewing, and interrogating suspects executing search warrants and arrest warrants, assisting outside agencies with investigations, monitoring social media for our intelligence purposes, processing crime scenes, conducting over undercover operations, registering Megan's Law offenders, uh, running asset forfeiture, 
and participating in the threat assessment uh, work and workplace violence teams. I think the director's going to talk about that in a minute, but those are two crucial teams that we, uh, we are members of and are very important to our success here. Uh, threat assessment. Um, after Virginia Tech, every uh, university police department uh, started up a threat assessment team. Sometimes um, some of the students have uh, mental health issues that need to be addressed and they can be a threat to themselves. Sometimes they can be a threat to others. Uh, task is where we go through the circumstances of each individual case and we refer them appropriately. Sometimes that's to a soft landing where they get the help they need um, and they get back on track. Sometimes it's a separation from the university. Sometimes it becomes a law enforcement issue. Um, very um, hardworking people on that, that committee. It involves the dean of students, uh, mental health services, the police department, a whole host <coughs> of uh, people involved in that. Workplace violence team. So uh, that's sort of the same thing, but for uh, faculty and staff. Because let's not forget, we have a lot of people working here. They also have issues <coughs> sometimes in the workplace with mental health and with uh, criminal justice issues. And that's a separate team. We separate that group from the students. Um, but we do work very hard. And all those areas that we just mentioned, we work regularly. And we have a very close relationship with the New Brunswick Police Department, in particular their bureau. It's not uncommon for us uh, to be working a case for them in the same car. And I'm in daily uh, contact with my counterpart over in New Brunswick. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, security operations. This is that full-time civilian staff I talked about. Um, they're uniform eyes and ears for us. One of their main functions is parking enforcement. Um, about 100,000 100, parking tickets are issued annually. We have a lot of spaces here, kind of just not where the students want them though. You know? <laughs> so uh, one of the things, you know, one of the things you want to uh, want to uh, reinforce with your son or daughter is, you know, parking. I mean, because it comes up when you try and register again and you have tickets, it be can become an issue, okay? Um, in terms of what the other things that they do, uh, they do building lockouts, they inspect campus lighting, they check our emergency phones, and a whole host of other uh, service related <coughs> functions. One of the big service functions that we do that's underutilized is escorts, okay? Uh, that's 732-932-7211. We'll do an escort for a student, you know, anywhere on or near campus, all right? If they call us and say, hey, it's late and we need, we need, uh, we need a ride, we'll help them out. Um, it's underutilized. I mean, here's the thing. When I was a student here, is it cool to ride in a public safety car? <laughs> you know what I mean? So. We kind of understand that, and we're working on ways to, uh, to, to get past that. Um, our buses run basically 24-7. Um, Sunday through Wednesday, we have the night mover, which hits certain areas throughout the campus, so you always have some way of getting around. Um, as I said, we have our escorts, too. You can use that. Um, community service officers, this is our student component. They have a variety of functions as well. Um, this is one step beyond community policing. So we talked about what we do to work together with the community to solve problems. Well, we bring the community in, all right? We say, hey, Rucker students, we want you to be part of our public safety community, all right? I think these are, these are uh, young men and young women that may have an interest in uh, uh, criminal justice field in the future. But the fact that they're out there, even, even when they're going to class, they may report information that they see that is suspicious, and they're eyes and ears for us even when they're not on duty. So it, it really helps out. Uh, communications key. Uh, Paul talked about threat assessment and workplace violence. You know, we meet with residents' life all the time. We have a close tie with FBI, with the state and county local law enforcement. Um, and we have a representative on the county task force. So communication's key, all right? Every year we publish our crime stats, okay? And we'll be publishing within the next two weeks, we'll, next two weeks we'll be publishing our 2014 crime stats, okay? We're always a year behind kind of because we're collecting data, <coughs> okay? Our stats look pretty good, pretty stable, all right? Um, one incident we had last year that uh, upped our aggravated assault, all right? 
uh, but we made an apprehension on it. All right, we had an we had an arson inside of the Ark Building, which is on Bush Campus. Okay, I don't know if you guys heard about that. Um, uh, a person with psychological issues started a fire inside of one of our academic buildings. Um, there were six people inside the building at the time. Fire went up. Our suppression system took the fire down. Okay, everything worked for us. All right, cameras worked. We got a picture of the person leaving the building. All right, we took that picture of the person we had from the building, punched it out over our law enforcement communication networks. We got a call from the Edison Police Department of a detective who recognized the person and the car. Okay, we had it solved within the matter of a couple days. Now, when we carry the stat under the Cleary stats, we had to carry six aggravated assaults because that, that guy started that fire, and it's essentially it's, it's almost attempted murder on six people. Now, his, his, he didn't know anybody in that building. The person just had some mental, <coughs> mental issues. Um, but you see how one incident has an impact on the statistics, okay? And, um, you won't, you won't get that information inside that uh, statistical breakdown, but if you ever have a question, feel free to reach out and, and I can explain it to you. The other thing that impacts our stats for 2014, first year of the integration with UMDNJ, okay? So we brought on all their buildings in New Brunswick and Piscataway and brought all their staff and all their students, okay? So now we cover a larger area, right? We got more people on campus. So we're taking those crime stats on too. So that's a full year is part of that uh, 2014 stat breakdown of which we didn't have in the 2013, okay? But I'm still confident that our stats were pretty good for the year, all right? Uh, crime alerts, we issue both crime alerts for on and off campus, okay? When do we issue crime alerts? When it's an ongoing threat and it's a serious crime, okay? So we do that for on campus. We do it because we're certainly because it's good to do, but because we're required to do it. Off campus, we're not required to do it, but we do it, okay? And, um, you know, we, we had a recent incident uh, just last week where we made uh, an apprehension on a robbery. We didn't put out a crime alert on it right away. The reason being, there was no ongoing threat, okay? We scooped the people up, people are under arrest, they're put away in jail, okay? Community doesn't have to worry about it, all right? We did reach out to the media outlets and, and kind of push it out, but there's a balance here because the more and more information you push out, people become kind of uh, desensitized, okay? So when you talk to a student, they say, Hey, did you read that crime alert? Yeah, well, it's just another one, you know? So what we want to do is we want to try and be, we, we want to try and balance and, and put, the, put the information out that needs to get out there. This really didn't need to get out there right away because everybody was apprehended, okay? Um, there is a way of looking at all of our information online through our, uh, our crime log. That's published on our website. Um, but as I said, we do put out information through uh, our crime alerts. If you go to our website, rupd.ruckers.edu, it'll give you it'll give you all the information on how you sign up for the ability to get crime alerts, which is through Nixle. Okay, so your your children get the crime alerts, but if you want to get them, you, you just hop on to Nixle and you can get them on your cell phone. Social media, we have a social media presence on Facebook and Twitter. That's growing for us. Our neighborhood patrol team, okay, about a year, year and change ago, we entered into an agreement with New Brunswick. We put two, uh, we put a Rutgers officer together and a New Brunswick officer together, okay? They ride the 5th and 6th Ward in New Brunswick. That's the area um, kind of behind Easton Avenue. Uh, between Robert Wood Johnson and St. Peter's Hospital, okay? We ride that area together at night with New Brunswick Police Department, gives us real-time information, okay? We both respond to calls together. If a call comes into New Brunswick, we'll have the information on it right away, all right? We've increased patrols 
Um, in the general College Avenue area, about five to seven patrols go out each night during the academic year. Okay, so your your son or daughter are going to see an increased presence out there. <laughs> um, these people that go out there, they're high visibility, um, and you know they're working together. Um, to kind of bring us information and, and to make it a safer place. Okay, kind of what I'm here to talk about today um, is a symbol there. Uh, we have a partnership with um, our Division of Student Affairs and what we're trying to do and what we've done, we've put, we recognize that we want to have more patrols out there in the 5th and 6th Ward. All right. And when I addressed the Parents Association last year, that was what everybody wanted, you know, more public safety patrols out there. So effectively, that's what we did, all right? And what I did was I put it out there. I kind of have it as kind of smarter and data-driven policing, okay? So I didn't want cars out there that are going to get called for theft reports and be taken off the road. Okay, because you know essentially that's what could happen. You just put another car out there. That's that's another part of your patrol. They'll get called away to do you know a, a theft report or something like that. What I what I wanted is patrols dedicated to that area. All right, I didn't want them just writing ordinances or stopping cars. I wanted I wanted them out there giving services to the community. So. Uh, in essence, the, the start of this fall semester, we put two patrols out in the 5th and 6th Ward. Okay, they're marked public safety vehicles, and their purpose is dual purpose. One, crime prevention, all right? They're, they're driving up and down the block. They have their uh, alley lights on, or lights that go to the side, and their takedown lights on. These are lights that go straight down the vehicle. They're like a roving flashlight driving up and down the block. And number two, they're, they're service oriented, okay? So if they see a student walking alone late at night, they're gonna stop by the student and say, is everything okay, do you need a ride? Okay, so that's their job out there. Um, what I've seen for the statistics so far, biggest statistic, over 500 contacts with the community. Okay, that's just in the past two weeks. They're driving up to people. Sometimes people are saying, hey, uh, you know, what are you, what are you doing out here? You know, because maybe they're not used to seeing that, that public safety presence out there. So still underutilized, but we're working on it. About 20 escorts, okay? And one of the most important things, um, they've helped at least two people that were in medical emergencies. And these medical emergencies were related to intoxication, okay? So a lot of times, and intoxicated or not, you, you, obviously, you don't deserve to be a victim, okay? But in a lot of the cases, our intoxicated students become victims, okay? So there were intoxicated people to the point where they were obvious, all right? We stopped, we got an ambulance there, and we got them to the hospital to help them out, okay? Took them off the street. So the prevention statistics and the crimes we're preventing, tough to measure, okay? But I think we're doing it, all right? Um, so we're also putting uh, patrols just adjacent to campus on, on uh, T3 vehicles, okay? This is what they are. Um, it's kind of a three-wheel segue, okay? But we kind of get more bang for the buck by putting uh, a, a security officer on one of these, they cover more ground in a quicker period of time. These things go up to 20 miles an hour. Um, they're able to, to go in the smaller areas. Um, they have lights, they have sirens on them. They can really make an impact. So we just rolled them out this year and hopefully, uh, hopefully they have a, a positive influence. This once again explains our uh, off-campus partnership with the Division of Student Affairs. Um, these patrols begin about 7 p.m. So we do patrols uh, right in this area as well. Okay, obviously it's a partnership not only 
uh, with the Division of Student Affairs, but the community at large, all right? We depend on the students to provide us information. Um, we consider the community an extra set of eyes. Um, this is a number that students should have programmed into their phone, okay? This is the non-emergency number that comes directly to us. Obviously, if it's an emergency, you dial 911. But if they have any questions and it's late hour and you know we're full service, they call us up and they say, hey, I just need some help, we're there to help them, all right? We have contacts 24-7 for psychological services, for any assistance that they need. We're the 24-7 contact for that. I appreciate your time. I know I probably took a little more time than I should have, but uh, it's important that I get the, the message out for us. And um, if you have any questions, there's my email address. Mark Sharp and I work for a brand new department within Student Affairs called Off-Campus Living and Community Partnerships. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our office because I don't want to keep you here way beyond your time, but I will be part of the Q&A at the end, so if you have any questions or I'll hang around after we're done to answer any questions that I did not cover in my little speech here. Who are we? we our office is the, excuse me, our office, our primary goal is to provide services for the students who live in the off-campus community. Um, through service, education, we do not, unlike the RAs that live on campus, we do not do enforcement. We are all about educating students about their responsibilities and what they need to know about living on campus. We provide these services for both the students who currently live off campus and students who are looking to move off campus. In some of the services we provide, we, um, through a third party, we run a off-campus housing list called placesforstudents.com, where most of the students, most of the landlords who own properties in the immediate area can list their properties on the site. The students can go in, create a profile, they can search for off-campus housing, they can also search for roommates and or sublets if they're looking to sublet like an apartment over the summer or during winter break, etc. Uh, in November, our, I should have started by saying our office is brand new. It was started, opened in July. Um, we are currently housed in the Bush Student Center, which is on campus and far away from the students we serve, but we are moving soon uh, to a home on College Avenue. Um, our office will be doing an off-campus housing fair in November, so landlords can come and display the properties that they're renting in the area and students can come and get a first-hand look of the properties that are available to them to rent off campus. Um, during that housing fair, we partner, our office is all about partnerships, partnering with different um, departments like RUPD for security and safety issues. We partner with um, Student Legal Services. Student Legal Services is a fully um, functioning uh, attorney's office that is under Student Affairs as well. During our housing fair, they will come and they will do lease reviews for your students for free. Um, they will also, at some point during the year, come and have workshops in our office where they will provide the same services for your students for a nominal fee. Um, we will do life off campus workshops. So we uh, budgeting, you know, students come from living at home to living in residence halls to moving off campus for the first time and they forget that they have to pay a water bill or they have to pay utilities or they, oh, I have to actually pay for food. Um, so we do budgeting workshops. Um, we will do healthy um, eating workshops so students know how to cook the food that they now have to budget to pay for. Um, we will also we're on workshops in conjunction with our Student Legal Services Office about what students should look for in a lease before they sign it. Um, we also want to teach the students that not only are they, when they move off campus, they're not just moving into a rental property, but they are really becoming citizens and residents of New Brunswick. So they are kind of like moving out of their residence hall and moving into a house right next to you. So they have, you know, 30-year-old parents, newly parents with babies that need to sleep. So when they're partying at three or four in the morning every single night, you know, we're trying to educate the students that, you know, you were moving off campus and you were part of a larger community and you have um, responsibilities in living in the community. 
So if some of you have noticed, um, part of our education is through humor. So our office created the Ten Commandments of Living Off Campus, and that's what, these are some of them that are posted at the bottom of the screen. Thou shalt not pee on thy neighbor's lawn or in any public space. Thou shalt not party on the roof of thine dwelling. Um, on our online resource on our website, we have, um, Thou shalt not put thy red cello up on thy neighbor's lawn. On our online sources, we have a housing list, as I spoke about. We have checklists for you know, what to look for in an off-campus place before you move in. A uh, roommate questionnaire, because you want to know who your roommate is before you move in with them, because you might be the person that needs a very quiet space to study 24 hours a day, and your roommate might be the party animal that needs to party all the time. That might not be the best match for your students. Um, we have contacts for different offices within Rutgers and within the city of New Brunswick. One of our major partnerships is with the city of New Brunswick with their housing inspections office and with their rent control offices because students don't understand that most properties in New Brunswick are rent controlled. So, you know, a landlord might give them a lease and says, oh, the lease for your house is $4,600 a month when legally through the city of New Brunswick, they're only allowed to charge them $3,600 a month, whether that's nine people living there or four people living there. So we've developed this great relationship with them where they've been, when we have students that come to us that need help with their lease or feel like they're being overcharged, we refer them to the rent control office. Um, we actually unfortunately had a situation just last week where a student came in and said, hey, I signed a lease before the school year ended with a landlord who said nine people could live in this house with us. Um, when they went to rent control, they said, well, technically, the house only has four bedrooms, legal bedrooms, so it's only um, zoned to have four occupants. So when they came back at the end of August to move into this apartment, uh, the two bedrooms that were supposed to be created in the basement before they signed the lease didn't exist. So three of the seven ladies living in this house were evicted because housing, housing inspections office was called. They went out and did an inspection and said, hey, only four of you can live here. So three of them left. Um, we were able to help them find other housing. But those are the partnerships that our office is creating with the city of New Brunswick to make sure that our students are living safely, living in residences, in residences that are zoned to have the number of students living in them. Um, and there's also transportation information, whether it's bus, Rutgers bus information, or um, New Jersey transit information. I will not talk about the safety because Chief Cop talked about the safety aspect. Um, and uh, this, uh, we made this PowerPoint actually for some, for a group of RAs. So that's why it's, tell your friends that we exist. Tell your students that we exist. Because if you have students that are looking to move off campus, we can assist them with locating housing and with all of the educational things they need before they make a decision on where to live, what landlord to choose, um, and what community they want to be in. Um, we also want to teach our students that we really do need to show respect for the community that they're living in. We, we have, I think I skipped, I will leave that up there. I skipped in one of the previous slides. We have a call, campaign called the Give Where You Live program, which is community service that is dedicated solely to giving back to the city of New Brunswick. So we have students that work, they do not only do they do community cleanups, they work locally in the Ronald McDonald House, they provide services, community service at Elijah's Promise, which is the um, local um, uh, soup kitchen. Soup kitchen, thank you, that's where I was looking for. Um, <laughs> And a variety of other community partners that we that we work with to provide community service for them. Does anybody have any questions about this? Yes, ma'am. Um, if a student uh, living on campus has habitability issues, you know, not enough heat, uh, roaches, or some other issue that the landlord won't address, do you need to be? Yes, what will happen is, and we've had a few of those issues, um, the students will call our office. We will make an attempt to contact the landlord, but we will also, they can come to our office, file an official complaint with their landlord. We will then f file that complaint or forward their complaint to the city of New Brunswick, the, um, the rent control office. 
they will then have a housing inspector go out to the house and if the housing inspector deems that a violation is being is occurring they will issue a citation to the landlord to fix um, we also just we had a meeting with the new brunswick police about doing security checks on actual apartments so they have a detective that will come out to their off-campus residence and walk the perimeter of their house with the student and tell them, you know, there are security issues here. This lock needs to be changed because the door is not secure. These bushes should be trimmed so people can't hide behind the bushes and climb into your window. Um, once he does that security check, he will issue your student um, a write-up of the inspection. The student can then take the inspection to the landlord and the landlord basically will either fix it, or if we hear that the landlord does not want to fix it, the police officer will then report it to the housing inspections office, will then send a violation to the landlord that says, these are security issues, you need to fix them. Yes, sir? Do you have any kind of a certification program for landlords that, that means they will meet certain Criteria. We do not as of yet, but we are literally three months out of the box, so, but that is on our list of things that we would like to see happen in the near future. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned that you're having housing there, and often this happens later in November. Mm -hmm. So students are looking for housing for next year, they should start looking in November? I think that students generally start looking for housing around December, January time but we want to be proactive and have the landlords on campus so they can see what they're looking for. It's easier to, you know, for, to actually come and meet a landlord, get to know a landlord. You know, I don't necessarily know that I want to rent a place for Matt Ferguson, but <laughs> if uh, Barbara Blackwell, Barbara Blackwell, who most of you might know, used to work for family and parent programs, we stole her and brought her to our new office for off-campus living. Um, she is an amazing resource for us um, and keeps us running. Um, but we want the students to be able to meet real, actual landlords and see the spaces that they could possibly be moving into before they actually go and move into them. Yes, ma'am? This may be getting too technical, but when there's a group of students in one building, how do they get It all depends on the lease, but technically whoever signs that legal document is responsible for making sure the, the rent is paid. Which is sometimes the parents who right. co-sign that lease. And uh, it's really, it's one lease with however many names that are legally allowed to live in that residence. Legally. Like, like this person gets this bedroom, this person gets this bedroom. That's, can't have well, separate that's amongst the, the students. No, 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 but you can't have a lease for I'm paying for no. this bedroom. No, you can, no. There's not a lease. That that would be a rooming house. Right. If it's a rooming house, then if it's a legal rooming house, it would have exit signs, it would have a fire alarm, and a lease for each room. But for a whole house that students are going in together, they would just sign one lease. And according to rent control, they determine how many people can legally live in that dwelling according to the actual space, the common space, and how large it is. Um, if there's 19 people living in a house, I highly doubt that that's legal, um, and I highly doubt that 19 people signed the lease. So that's, that's where we come into effect. We're also, uh, just, I'll interject real quick. We're also, if you read our last <laughs> newsletter, because some of you, this may not apply to you right now, and we actually have someone here from Residence Life we're gonna bring up in a moment if you have residence related questions. But as you begin to have these conversations with your students, perhaps in their future years, the who signs the lease is really critical. And we're trying to educate both our students and our parents on what's called social host liability in the state of New Jersey. Meaning that the folks that sign the lease are liable or could be liable for the social activities of that off-campus premise. 